The Honeydew with Ryan Sickler. Welcome back to The Honeydew, y'all. We're over here doing it in the Night Pan Studios. I'm Ryan Sickler, ryansickler.com. Ryan Sickler on all your social media. Listen, go watch the special. Go to my YouTube Subscribe there, check out the special, comment on it, share it, like it. Still almost 700,000 views, even after being taken out of the algorithm. Not taken down. You just got to go search it and find it and make it a lot harder. That's that's what's going on. Um, and I just want to thank you guys for supporting the show. We're here at the new studio. We've got a lot of new stuff going on. I'm very excited about it. Some things to tell you about. Uh, and if you got to have more and you got to have the Patreon, go to the Patreon. It's five bucks a month. It's the honeydew with you all. And I promise you, it's a cup of coffee. You get hundreds of episodes and you're never going to hear anything like you heard on that Patreon. All right. You get the honeydew a day early. You get it ad free. You get it at no additional cost. It's five bucks. It's been five bucks. We've never raised it. All right. So go check it out. And if you sign up for a year, you get a month worth of episodes for free. All right. That's how that goes down. Uh, And if you're looking for a new podcast to listen to, Go check out my old podcast, The Crab Feast with Jay Larson. I'm telling you, Kirsten will tell you, we're on the road nonstop, and people come up all the time. They're touching my pitch in the crowd. They're yelling, fuck the Crab Feast. It's still a very thriving community. The episodes are great. Go check it out. Subscribe to that. All right. Now, if you want to come see me on tour and uh, I'm in your city when you're there, then let's do it. uh, August 11th. Here in L.A. at Flappers. Come out and check out that show. Going to have some special guests on that. August 18th and 19th, Tampa, Florida. September 1st and 2nd, Springfield, Missouri. September 15th and 16th, we're going to be in Tulsa. The 29th and 30th of September is Phoenix. The 27th and 28th of October is Salt Lake City. And December 8th and 9th is San Francisco, California. All right? Those are the dates. Go get all the tickets at Ryan Sickler. Dot com. Now, that's the biz you know we do over here. We highlight the lowlights. I always say these are the stories behind the storytellers. And I am very excited to have this guest on here today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mike Feeney. Welcome hey, to the Honeydew. Hey, wow. That was, that was a, you startled me the way you said that. Got to fire it up, bro. <laughs> you fired me we we got to fire you up, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like great. that moment after lunch on a set and everybody's got that lull. You got to kick them in the ass yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Just a quick. You just sit there and listen to that. Intro, yeah. it lulls you a little bit. It did. I wanted to fire you up. Yeah, so, you have uh, a very like silky, like maple syrupy voice. You know, like it's that. very. It's like I could just kind of sink into a bath of it. You know. All right. Well, let's get into a <laughs> bath of that, bro. Um, will you please, before we begin, plug, promote everything? Mike sure. MikeFeenyComedy dot com for tour dates. I'm going to be at the uh, Algonquin Theater in Manasquan, New Jersey, doing a, uh, a a stand up and live podcast with my podcast. Here's a scenario with Mike Cannon and Brennan Zagalo. We each do stand up, then we do a live pod at the end. Very fun. Um, I'm also headlining the Den Theater on October seventh in Chicago. So if you're around. Please come to that. Um, I have a YouTube special out called Rage Against the Routine. Um, Mike, uh, YouTube.com slash Mike Feeney Comedy. And I just recorded and I directed and am editing my own, my second comedy special that should be coming out in the next uh, month or two. So we have to, I haven't picked an exact date for that yet. But again, YouTube.com slash Mike Feeney and at, uh, at I am Mike Feeney across every social media. All right, you got them all. That's it. I just, I just, just I, I, at one point I was going Mike Feeney here. I am right. Mike Feeney here. And then I just went blanket, you know? Yeah. No one's taken I am Mike Feeney, you know? No. There is an at Feeney I really wanted to get That's on Twitter wonderful. for a while. And then some, I spent, it was an inactive account. I spent years like, and did like public, you know, outcry things just as a bit to get people to like report the inactive account so they would delete it. Then they finally deleted it. I mean, I must have, I must have posted hundreds of tweets about this thing as a bit over the years. They finally deleted it, and then within 24 hours, uh, somebody from like a bank, like a no. prudential bank, got it. And then I was like, 
Listen, I reached out. It was like some woman, like, you know. Like, Listen, Mrs. Feeney. Yeah, it was like Chris. I gotta tell you something. <laughs> she's like, Kristen Feeney, come see me at the bank for a loan. And I was like, Listen, I've I don't know if you know the the groundswell of 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 work that I've done to get this released and back. So I was like, if you could just and then she was like, I personally don't care. Let me let me send you to the corporate thing. And then I reached out to them and they're like, Yeah, we're just not gonna. We're not going to let that go. So uh, after all that, after all that, even so, though she was willing to, she was willing to, but she, she's also like a 50 year old woman that just yeah. she didn't know what Twitter was. Right. You know what I mean? But regardless, so at I am Mike Feeney, keep it simple. Um, so let me let me learn a little bit about you. Yeah, uh, we hung out before at the store. Not yes. long. So yep. where are you from? Tell us a little bit about your background first. From, from Long Island, New York, um, lived in New York City ever since I graduated college, so 2008. Uh, and that's when I started doing comedy. And uh, I've been doing it ever since. Living in Queens, got a wife and an eight-month-old kid. Oh, congrats. Thank you. All right. Yeah, so that's uh, that's been a life adjustment. Yeah, yeah. yeah it is. <laughs> um, but it's great. But yeah, so it's... But yeah, growing up in Long Island, it's like a very, you know, suburbs, but there's the beaches and there's access to New York City. So it feels like a very, uh, we always, you always joke the thing in Long Island is people always go, oh, I can go to Manhattan anytime I want because it's, you know, an hour on the train. No, no one ever goes, you know what I mean? They just talk about going. And then right. since then, Long Island has gotten more and more like, you know, its own world. You know what I mean? Like the their politics have very much changed. People are like hardcore, you know, identity politics with everything now is crazy, but they're like, hardcore like all my friends you know we used to listen to like hardcore music and punk music and we go to concerts now everyone drives a ford f-150 and has chewing tobacco and listens to country music it's like you guys live in the suburb you know in like long they, island in long island oh, i wouldn't have guessed in that parts yeah. Of, yeah in parts of long island it gets very like they're big country music people now yeah. they think that they like can identify with like cattle ranch culture and stuff like that in long so, island. yeah yeah <laughs> you know like bruce springsteen yeah. kind of has this thing of being like i'm a I'm just like a working class, like, yeah, you know, blue collar. I'm a blue collar. I, I till the earth with I'm my hands. Man. Remember that yeah. commercial he come out for like, I think it was for like Wrangler or, or, or like some or Ford. Maybe it was during the Super Bowl a couple of years ago where he's like installing like fences <laughs> on a ranch with his hands. And you're like, dude, you have been the, one of the most famous people on the planet for 95 percent of your life. Like you were a blue collar guy for like 10 16 seconds. years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like, ever since then, you you've been the system, you, yeah. You've been this elite rich, but now he's just like, I'm just one of you, you know. Yeah. No, like, you're not. Yeah. You, ain't been, you ain't been one of us since you had your motherfucking driver's yeah. license, Springsteen. Okay, and, and that's why I don't know why, but I think it's Jersey, New York. But there's this Billy Joel versus Bruce Springsteen thing. They're not even like really comparable in terms of their music, but it's a very contentious. Like you either have to love one or the other, and they should tour together. Then they really, I mean, they would sell out arenas. But I mean, but Billy Joel to me. Again, I have a Long Island bias here, but he is just like, talk about like a salt of the earth. You know what I mean? There's no no pomp and circumstance. The dude, he just drinks. He drives his car into a tree, walks home. Like he's there's no ego there. You know, he's just I'm a guy. Now he just takes his helicopter from from his uh, from his house right to Madison Square Garden, does his you know nine million sold out show, and then takes it right back home. Still pops On the in. Hits. Yeah, oh, just he hasn't put, hasn't put out anything since the On '90s. The hits, it's bro. it's crazy. I have a joke in my first special about how saying like my wife and I's sex life at this point being together so long, it's like going to a Billy Joel concert because we're just playing the hits, no new shit, everybody's happy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like you're never gonna That's go to a true. Billy Joel concert. He's gonna be oh, like, wait, he's doing it earlier yeah. than he did it last night. Yeah, That's the yeah, only difference. Yeah, yeah, Not yeah, I exactly. played this sixth last yeah. night. Oh, the tonight. stranger yeah. so early. <laughs> I mean, you gotta love Billy Joel too. In our line of work, what's the line? Closed the shop, uh, sold the house, bought a ticket to the West Coast. Now he gives him a stand-up routine in L.A. Come on. Yeah. I mean, That's he's Billy Joel, he's bro. He's just. He knew what's and up. And he also, like, he pops into local, like, Long Island music venues and just will either, like, be there or sometimes he'll, like, sit. in like, there's sometimes a Billy Joel cover band will play in Long Island and he'll just go hang out and then he'll, like, jump on stage with them for a couple songs. And so, like, people that are seeing a $10 show just happen to see Billy Joel in a 200 seat. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah he's just. He's a good dude. I don't know. I have no idea if he's a good dude. I want him to be a good dude. I hear you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hear you. Um, so tell me about growing up. You have siblings. Tell me about your parents. Only child. Uh, product of divorce. Parents got divorced. What age? 
right in like the I hate everything phase of life, you know, like probably 12, 13, you know, adolescent, just like. When it's hitting you natural, even if your parents love each other. Dude, just yeah. rage against the machine and system of a down and yeah. just being like angry about everything. And, Why uh, did your parents split? Uh, I assume the constant uh, uh, awful fighting that they happened. It was never like anything like physical, but just like screaming. I think they were a little bit like, you know, my dad, my mom is a very like, she's a firecracker. You know what I mean? She's just kind of, I think even after she had the kids, she's like, I still want to go out. I still want to like party and be the life of Does the thing. Did they have kids young? Um, I don't know. They were like, they were like about, I think my mom was 28 and my dad was like 31 or something. Like it wasn't, you know, it was More for sure. Teenagers or anything. Yeah, no, no, no. But they were, my mom was just kind of like, I like going out. And my dad became a lot more of like a, you know, he was, my dad's like comes from an Irish Catholic family of, you know, of, of a bunch of siblings where it's like you, you work and, you know, he's working 80 hour weeks while trying to get a graduate degree while also, you know, raising a kid. So he just was very much like, stay, you know, let's stay home. Let's raise the kid. And my mom was like, you know, when I was in elementary school, my mom would take me out like to bars with her. When really? I was, yeah. When nah. I was like, yeah, dude, I was like a kid. What year is that? Um, I mean, I, so I was born in 87, so I guess this was like, yeah, that's the, later to me. I can't believe you could still do that. Yeah. In the early I, mean, I don't 90s. know that you could, <laughs> <laughs> but we did. There was, uh, there was this Irish bar that we would go to a ton in Long Island, uh, down in Port, in Port Jeff. And we would, uh, you know, it was literally a biker bar. Like it was just an Irish biker bar, that place where it's like, it's dark at 12 and there's people hanging out in the bar. And I, this is how young I was. Um, you know, those like little like pop shot basketball mm-hmm. kind of, they had one of those. I was young enough where they put me inside the cage on the no. other side of where the balls go down and I would just be free throwing from two feet out while there's like, you <laughs> that know. That was your playpen <laughs> yeah, while your mom dude. was drinking. Dude, <laughs> well, that um, was your fucking playpen, dude. <laughs> and to this day. Do you have a pack and play? Do, I'm telling you, you I did. That's your pack and play. Do, you got an eight month old. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's my Slumdog Millionaire. I <laughs> never lose a pop shot to this day, dude. It's like a muscle memory. I know the touch, dude. Best babysitter ever, <laughs> Yeah, dude. and Holy so, shit. and like, yeah, dude, it was just a biker bar. And I would, uh, you know, there was some like, there was some rough crowds in there and stuff. But I remember, uh, apparent, my mom tells a story of one time I went up to like, apparently the, you know, the most standoffish, don't fuck with this biker guy because he's always in a bad mood. Just let him sit at the corner of the bar and drink. And I, I, he had like the leather, you know, vest on and all that stuff. And I went up to him and I, I look like a kid, you know, I'm a child. And I was like, I was like, oh, sir, I was like, you have some. I didn't, even, I couldn't even say spaghetti. I said you have some sketty on your shirt. And then he looked down and I flicked nah. his nose, just <laughs> flicked his nose. And it was like the record scratched. Everyone, <laughs> everyone was on the edge of their seat, you know. And then he laughed about it and I was like, oh, all right. <laughs> It's like, he's killed seven people. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's just stomping. The, yeah. But, uh, All right, so wait, yeah. hold on. Why is mom hanging out in a biker bar? Is she that type of... She came from... She spent She spent college in Florida. She used to ride Harleys. Okay, so she, she kind of... Your has, mom. Yeah, my mom. Dude, you do not look like you come from a Harley mom. I know, I know. She's got two bikes again. She didn't have... What's her like, name? Is it like Debbie, Sharon? Debbie. Debbie. Oh, yeah. That's, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Name, no <laughs> yeah, yeah. No so doubt. she was She was very much What's like... Up, Debbie? <laughs> yeah. No tattoos either, which is crazy. Wow. I thought she for sure would have got some a like, lot of denim yeah, and leather and stuff. A lot of denim. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but <laughs> so, so wait, this is great, dude. So Debbie comes from a Harley background, like sort of like was her dad or your grandfather, or my, uncles, anything? My, or is that just her thing? My uh my her she had a uh she has an older brother, my uncle, who's I think like twelve years older and he had a bike at one point, but he's more just like he's a musician. Mm-hmm. And, but my grandfather was like World War Two vet, like Side police car. police officer. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Police officer, yeah. he was like uh, NYPD for like 37 years. Okay. Like he was, but he was also weirdly enough, like the most loving, like, you know, for a guy who was in World War II, for a guy who did all that shit, he was the most, he's the most like, he always said, I love you. He's very affectionate. He was crazy. It was like the opposite. You would give him every excuse. He was born in 1920. It's like you give him every excuse to be like, 
you know, a racist or like a or like a hardened, not uh, emotional guy. And he was, uh, to his credit, he was he was the best. That's great. Yeah. yeah. All right. So mom's hanging out in biker bars, not because that's where she can get away with taking her kid, but she also is of that. Those yeah. are her people. She was that ilk. Yeah. We and was were, your dad also in that world? No. Just, okay. No. So let's they talk just, about they, that. They grew up a block. Uh, they grew up two blocks away from one another. And my dad's best friend uh, introduced them. And weirdly enough, my dad lived on Deb Street, which is a very nah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, very strange. Um, but Looks like it turned out to be a dead end street. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they were like, you Literally know, they were, they were, they were, they were. I guess they would party. I guess, and you know, before they had me or something. But then I think it was again just that different ideas of like once we had the kid like let's be right. you know a more you know traditional household and you know and my and my dad would try to be like let's take him to church and everything but then like the second i w- i was i was catholic the second Your we got taking him to the church or harley david yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah my mom did not go to church with us she would like she would stay back and like make breakfast so that when we came back and everything but so like, you just you and your dad would go yeah i think my mom went the first few times uh-huh. and then was like i not making it uh but do then, you remember because kids are smart do you remember at early age, like I, maybe it was wrong or whether it was wrong or not, like was hang out with mom more fun and hang out with dad for did you, sure. You, did Cause you yeah, cause that? dad was like more of a disciplinary and, yeah. and like he wasn't, he like, he didn't even, I don't even think my dad believes in God. I think he just was kind of like, this is what you're supposed to right. do, you this know, especially coming Sunday from an is. Irish Catholic right. family. You yes. got to go to church. And the second I like got my confirmation, we literally never went ever yeah. again. That was like the last day we ever so went. So did you get that documentation, yeah. bro? It's like, <laughs> yeah. and we're the fuck out of here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Exactly. So it was just, I graduated yeah. and never coming back. So I think there was like constant fighting about like, you know, like that kind of a situation. We would come home. It would be probably like, I don't know. It would be way past a bedtime for a child on a school night. With your mom. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. We'd like come back and my mom would have to be like, you know, the prepping in the car of like, we don't have to like say where we were, you know, like that kind of a little but bit of But isn't she like, always at the same spot? Essentially, yeah, 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 yeah. So, which again, it just became kind of like a contentious thing. And then they would always fight about that, which, you know, looking back on it, you're like, I think my dad had pretty, pretty good uh, claims, you know, for being angry and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So it was like, that was for sure a uh, a constant source of fighting for them because then my mom felt like she was being like she was being like turned into just like a house mom kind of a thing and I don't know all this other stuff but She's a but she also mom. had jobs too she also she worked in like nail salon she they she had bought a nail and hair salon like six months before she got pregnant with me and oh, then really? and then that was like well I can't do this and then she just worked in nail salons my whole life which was great I always got free haircuts you know and stuff like that you at got the hair some good salon salad up thanks there, man. Bro. Yeah, you do. <laughs> Thanks, dude. Good head of lettuce. And I would just, I would like sweep up hair and like, you know, I would also make terrible prank phone calls using that thing when I got older and stuff. It was, uh, so you're just entertaining yeah. yourself while this is going on. Yeah, the only head. child thing, man. You know, yeah. it's like all my neighbors had like five kids. So it was, I was always like that kid who was, you know, I would hang out with them. Then they would go back home and continue playing. And I would be like, ah, oh, shit. So I'd do my own, you know, that's where you get an imagination, I guess, yeah. if you're an only child. But, uh, one time I was at my mom's uh, hair salon. And I, again, I was young. I don't remember how old, but definitely like 10 or under. And I like, I w- there was a phone in the back, like an old rotary phone. And I just was like, here's a fun prank. And I'll just call 911. And then I called 911. And then they answered. And I hung up. And then I was like, that was kind of fun. And then I picked up the phone and I called 911 again. And then I hung up. And I was like, that was a fun bit for just me. And then I just kept being going about my business. And then, you know, 20 minutes later, two police cars come up. And because they think like a hostage situation is happening, you know oh, what I mean? There's no. like multiple calls <laughs> with a click. So they're like, something terrible is happening. <laughs> so they they send police <laughs> and the cops come in and they're like, what's going on? And now the whole, you know, it's like a busy hair salon. There's like plenty. And everyone's like, what? Who, who called 911? Who called 911? And I'm having that moment of like, oh, oh God. I'm going to be in so much trouble. I'm going to have to admit it's me. And then there was a mother there with like her like kids that were a little bit younger than me. And they were kind of being like a terror. And she was like, it, it was probably my kids. I'm so sorry. And like these kids got in so much trouble. Like, yeah, like, you just in the we're back never coming here like, again. Yeah, I'm like, I wouldn't be the kid sweeping hair. That kid's the, the most innocent of boys, you know? 
uh, and I great. got away with that. But yeah, it was. Uh, so when your parents split, do they yeah. stay close in proximity? Are you bouncing back and forth? Or are you primarily with mom or dad? How's I was that with work? mom. My my uh, my great my great uncle had just died, and he lived probably like a half hour away. So my dad moved there. So I was doing that for a couple years, and then my dad eventually moved to New York City. So then I was just taking the train into New York City every week. Uh, and how old? How old did you start doing uh, that? Probably like 14, I guess, yeah. maybe, or something like that. And then up and through, you know, up until, you know, he lived there for 20 years in, in uh, the east side of, Long Island, of uh, Manhattan. So that was cool, though. It felt cool to, like, take the trade into the city and all that other stuff. Like, it was a very, like, exciting, you know, exciting time to be like, a Long Island could be like, I'm going into the city yeah. every week, you know. And did your mom remarry or? They both got, my dad's remarried. My mom got re-engaged. Um, everyone's always like, when's the wedding? Why, why, why don't you have a date? And she's like, I'm never getting married again. And they go, why? And her exact line is, I already have the rock. Where is he going? Where you're like, <laughs> all right. <laughs> where is he going? Yeah, yeah, where would he go? You know, where does he got to go? Let him find something yeah. better. Yeah. And you're like, oh, yeah, yeah. You know? Which works for me because then if, if she dies, the money comes to me and not to, you know, mm -hmm. poor Jeff. Um, but uh, but it's interesting. Yeah, it is. I, I think about it all the time. Um, it's just this. I was it's so funny. I had an Uber driver bring it up to be marriage. And it's just this archaic contract. Like if anyone... Outside of marriage, if you, this was a business contract, we go, look, man, if this thing goes great, this is going to be amazing. Right. But if you fuck up or even if they fuck up, you could lose this and this and this and this. You would fucking say if it was a business proposal, most people I feel like would go. I'm not, it's I'm too not much gonna, risk. I'm, it's too much risk. Way I'm too much risk. So sixty percent yeah, uh, chance of failure. Yeah, that's yeah. the other thing. You it's, start throwing stats on top yeah. of it too. Yeah, yeah. Dude, yeah I mean, I, I would. Yeah, I, I was never. I was never the I, the guy. Goldie ever, like, and Kurt did it right, man. Yeah, they did. <laughs> Dude, I'm not. They did it right. Just, just be. Yeah, just be like partners and uh, you know share a life. Just like all. You, they have everything that everyone else does except for paperwork. Right. Even if they are legally whatever now, I know common law, whatever, but still. Yeah. There's no state involvement. There's certain things, you know, though. The government like, doesn't need to be involved in your wedding. Yeah, but there's other things where you're like access to health insurance and yeah. like, you know, power of attorney if I'm a vegetable. You know what I mean? There yeah. are those things where you're like, it'd be nice to have somebody. I was never going to, I never saw myself getting married, especially coming from divorce. I was like, I would never be like, the. You know, and then I just, you know, you meet the right person and whatever. And I met her early, you know, in college, like in my freshman year of college, I ended up meeting her and we're still together now. And it's great. But I think my grandparents are like my, my grandfather was a police officer and my grandmother, they're married 67 years. It's like, those are the, that's like the people that I look to, to be like, that's the 67 yeah. years. Their story is like, I have to like write a movie about Tell it at some point. It, they're just kind of like this, the notebook s sort of thing where they were, this is the same grandfather fought police, World War yeah, II. Yeah, so they, he was born in 1920. She was a little bit uh, younger than that. And they met um, and they would hang out in the neighborhood. My wife, my grandmother was like obsessed with him. He was like a little bit older. So and then, um, you know, they would hang out in Flushing and College Point, Queens. And, you know, just so poor. They were both so it was like depression. They, they had nothing, you know. And then uh, my grandfather's brother, World War II starts. My grandfather's brother gets... Uh, drafted into the war my grandfather didn't get drafted but he's like i'm gonna go sign up so he wanted to go to the uh the navy i think he wanted so he went into new york city took the police test so that way he's like you did not get drafted he hadn't got drafted too. yet i mean uh, maybe so he, he might have but said i'm gonna go where i want to go yeah, instead of being I guess, placed. yeah yeah he was just Fair like enough. i want to i got to do my duty my brother's going i'm going mm -hmm. so he went into new york city to take the police test so he'd have a job when he comes back and like one of the physical tests was like the hurdles and on like the first hurdle he like clipped his foot and then like landed directly on his knee and then had to do the rest of the test. So his knee was like blowing up. So he got done with the test. He's in Manhattan. He gets out. He's like limping around. And he says to like a person walking the street, he's like, where is the Navy recruitment center? And they were like, oh, it's like 15 blocks 
it's right this way. And then you make a left. And he was like, oh, okay. He's like, and where is the army recruitment center? And they were like, oh, it's like across the street. And then he went there. And so he just, <laughs> <laughs> so he just signed up for the that army. He's like, we're an army. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're going to the army. So he did like, he did like 52 missions across. He was, he was flying. Yeah, he was like this giant, like, you know, those giant bomber planes and stuff like that. He did. And, um, and even when they came back, you know, they were so, he was so poor and like, they were so poor, which now becomes like a beautiful thing, but they were so poor that my grandmother's wedding dress was made out of my grandfather's parachute from the war, no. like his silk parachute. And then she actually still fit in it for their 65th wedding anniversary. No way. It was crazy. Yeah. Dude, that he, is nuts. Yeah. And then he like, and then he wears Where's that dress right now? It's probably at my mom's house down in Florida. Debbie's yeah. Debbie's got that? Yeah, Debbie's got it. They're that. not out there fucking tying it on her back and going wheelies <laughs> yeah, and shit yeah, with yeah, a cape yeah, on. Yeah. <laughs> Watch this. Yeah. <laughs> Look at uh, grandma's dress in the wind. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy, dude. But, um, you know, and then he worked, like I said, 37 years, NYPD, uh, two kids, you know, light, and they just were like, they're the cutest couple you've ever seen in your life. They just were always, you know, very fun and laughing a lot together. So they were a good beacon of like, love can be a thing, you know? Um, so yeah, I don't know. Liquid IV, the number one powered hydration brand in America, is now available in sugar-free. Years in the making, hydration multiplier sugar-free uses a proprietary zero sugar hydration solution with no artificial sweeteners they've got tons of great flavors and even some new ones like white peach and sea berry the travel packs make it easy to use daily even when i'm on the road one stick of liquid iv and 16 ounces of water hydrates you two times faster and more efficiently than water alone liquid iv combines science back zero sugar technology with the brand's commitment a delicious real flavor no artificial sweeteners and zero sugar with a proprietary amino acid allulose blend for a sweet taste without the calories or raised blood glucose levels you get from sugar contains eight vitamins and nutrients for everyday wellness with three times the electrolytes of leading sports drinks plus it's non-gmo free from gluten dairy and soy real people real flavor Real hydrating, now sugar-free. Grab your Liquid IV hydration multiplier sugar-free in bulk nationwide at Costco or get 20% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use code HONEYDEW at checkout. And that's 20% off of anything you order when you use promo code HONEYDEW at liquidiv.com. The hair care products that you use can make or break your hair health. Overwashing, color treating, heat styling, and product usage can clog the scalp's pores or cause dryness, leading to a poor environment for hair growth. While Nutrafol's hair growth supplements target the root causes of thinning hair from within, Nutrafol's scalp care formulas help create a healthy environment for improved hair quality. The shampoo, scalp mask, and scalp essence are each gentle yet effective, and they work to exfoliate, purify, and balance the scalp for improved hair health. Nutrafol supplements are the foundation for healthy hair growth, while the scalp care products create an environment for hair to thrive. With just a simple daily routine, these formulas set you up for the healthiest hair yet. Take the first step toward improved hair and scalp health now. For a limited time, Nutrafol is offering our U.S. listeners $10 off your first scalp care order when you go to Nutrafol.com slash scalp and enter promo code HONEYDEW. Find out why over 4,000 healthcare professionals recommend Nutrafol for healthier hair. N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L dot com slash scalp and enter promo code HONEYDEW for $10 off your first scalp care order. This is available only to U.S. customers for a limited time. That's Nutrafol.com slash scalp. Promo code HONEYDEW for $10 off your first scalp care order. Now, let's get back to the do. Um, another thing we were talking about before we recorded, um, you mentioned you had some surgeries and stuff. And I wanted to talk to you about that because you said you've had quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. I'm, Go uh, back to the beginning and I'm tell us mess, what happened. Dude. What, what uh, happened? Are you like, born with well, first, health issues? First, yeah. I mean, the first thing, uh, the thing that I was born with um was i had like uh it's called pectus excavatum which is basically like a concave chest like my my ch it almost looked like a like a dented in ping pong ball. I, I knew a kid in um high school that had that, yeah yeah know? it's so funny because my best friend in elementary I didn't know school I had a name. yeah my best friend in L yeah we just we called just him like, weirdo the up your chest? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 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 yeah, 100%. Well, it's so weird because my best friend as a kid also had it. 
So I thought like oh, it was really? way more. Con- he lived in my. He lived a block from me. So I was like, I thought like <laughs> most know, kids, was like two and <laughs> yeah, a million, and yeah, you two yeah. happen to live exactly, here. dude. Yeah. <laughs> So like, you know, obviously the same clinic. Yeah. So obviously, like as a kid, like that was a pretty big source of like, uh, you know, self-consciousness and being like, you know, in public. I was I like my family would tell me it would be in we'd be at the pool or at the beach or something. I'd always kind of be like, you know, I think I would be like pretending I was cold to kind of like cover my chest and stuff like that. And then um, there was a surgery they used to be they used to do back when I was a kid where they would literally like cut you from like your Ch- the top of your chest all the way to your belly button like almost like butterfly you open break your ribs and like Jesus reconstruct Christ. it was like this barbaric crazy thing so my family thank god never got that for me when i was young and then when i became like is uh, this something they knew when you were born or did it just over time when you started growing they could see it was growing differently they knew i had it when i was born and then it was getting like it was starting to get like worse when i was because i would get headaches like every day this is what i want to ask you so is this a surgery that you absolutely have will it will it end up pushing in on lungs yeah or? they said it could eventually like uh go like push onto my heart like at some point in my Jesus. life so it was like you know so when i was like 15 they came out with this other like brand new revolutionary surgery in norfolk virginia where basically this guy like he created this like stainless steel bar that he just you do a, a slide you do a, a slice on the side of your rib and they basically put this bar in and then they just kind of turn it so it just oh. pops the chest out and then you keep the stainless steel bar in your chest both sides yeah well i mean they have it it's like yeah it's just like a straight across oh, and they the keep it they keep it in your chest for 3 years you, you had this i had this so i i got it when i was 16 and I, w- and I went and got this surgery and then you get this stainless steel bar and it just, it pops the chest out and you then- Look normal from here. Yeah, it feel, it's good now. It's a good time, you know? Like I feel like, I, I forget that, I honestly forget that that was ever like a whole part of you my life. You know like, what I mean? You ever just like dump milk down it and just let it just splash? Dude, when I, when I had a, when I had like a <laughs> hole, like, a, like yeah. a thing down here, dude, I'd put like popcorn in there <laughs> when I was a kid. It was like a little bowl, you know? Yeah, like, M&M. yeah, a hundred percent, man. It was for sure. It's like a straw, a little- <laughs> Pull it up. So I got this surgery. I got this surgery at 16. I had to keep this bar in my chest for three years till you stop growing. So, so to you're like uh, after 18. And how does that affect your life? Can you play sports? No, nope, that's where it affects my life. It's first off, it, you have a bar in your yeah, chest I that mean, you feel. Uh, you and do. it's like I, like I, I like saying. laying on my side. Felt It just does felt it weird. Shift and shit? I, I mean, like probably not, but it felt like it, it you ever feels hit it? like it was. Yeah, dude. Oh, oh, for sure. Like if you would hit it, it would like <laughs> really. Waking up from that surgery was like pretty, in terms of like pain level, it was like one of the worst. Like some guys though, get it so bad that they like, they have to get two bars because they're like taller and stuff, which is even brutal. But I got this one because I was getting headaches every day of my life, every day. And they said it was because I had a lack of oxygen from being able to like get full lung capacity from the chest. So I get this surgery and because of that, they're like, you can't do football. I mean, this is my was always my frame anyway. But like, you can't do football. You can't do like hard contact like sports or no anything MMA, like that. No yeah, boxing. no MMA, none of that <laughs> yeah. stuff. So I did like track and field and like crew. It was like rowing and stuff like that. So I did those things, but like I never really enjoyed that. You know, I always wanted to do like baseball. It's like but fucking braces for your ribs. Yeah, inside dude. it's so straight. You know, and it's like. So that was obviously like a whole story. And then after my freshman year of college, in between freshman year and sophomore year, I had to go get the bar removed, which what is, is like- that? How's that work? Uh, they it put just, you again, out, all I they, assume, all they do, that, It's like, you wouldn't even know, dude, I have no. like two little scars. They just literally like, yeah, they just, no. they just pull isn't it. it uh, isn't bone around it though? You'd think so. It came out that easy? D- Were you I, awake? No, God, okay, no. All God, right, God, right, yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> Screaming, yeah, no, no. I'm looking at sword, yeah, out yeah. <laughs> like taking the biggest <laughs> splinter out of the inside of your body. Um, no, yeah. So I had that done. So that was like that was obviously the most serious of the surgeries that I had because that was like a major, you know, uh, reconstructive surgery. And then when I was like, whatever year, however old, when I was like 2001 or something, I think around that time, I had a, uh, I had appendicitis, which was like a crazy night because I was like my dad had my I was with my dad that weekend he had taken me this is when he was still living in Long Island so it was before he moved to the city but we went into the city to go see a concert we actually we went to BB King's uh the the venue Mm -hmm. uh and we saw uh John Entwistle of The Who uh and this was actually his last concert before he died and he was completely deaf 
uh, at that point. Is that from, right? From I all know of that. the years of the, you know, and all the play. So he was completely deaf. And it was the loud, to this day, the loudest concert I've ever, because he has no idea how loud. It was the loudest concert I've ever been to in my life. And then we were coming back. It was just like this whole crazy day where like, I'm like, I'm like starting to be in pain. We're driving back to Long Island. There's so much traffic. So then my dad, like, every, like it's literally bumper to bumper. So my dad's like, I'm going to go off the on-ramp just to like get out of this. And like a bunch of cars were doing it. And then like, a hundred cars must have taken that on ramp, uh, that on ramp off, and then like the police came and gave like my dad a ticket, and then gave like the next five cars tickets. So we got tickets. So that slowed us down even more. So then my dad's pissed. We stop at a gas station, and my dad like moved. He like went to reverse his car, and he backed his car into a like ninja motorcycle. And and these people. <laughs> <laughs> Well, she's more the Harley. Yeah, she's the, yeah, but this is like the, these true. people, yeah. you know. And he he knocked the guy's bike over, and then it got like caught under his car. So my dad went to like move forward and was just oh, dragging no. this dude's bike. And this guy who like he dressed was he like, there? Did he see it? Yeah, yeah, oh, dude. Yeah. This guy was like a tw like a probably twenty something like just like black RoboCop, like the way he was dressed and like the whole thing, dude. And he went up to my dad's window and like just fucking was bashing the back of my dad's car, where like all of the you know it's spider web yeah. the whole back window. We had this old like Toyota Celica, so it was like almost that hatchback kind of thing. Bash that, and then him and my dad are like uh, like screaming at each other. I think my dad's gonna get killed. I'm like freaking. I'm like crying. I'm screaming. I don't know what's going on. So then we have to fill out the police report with all that. So it's like now it's like one or two in the morning. It's like the longest night ever. And I'm like again, my stomach is killing me this whole time. We like go over the bump to get out of the to get out of the gas station, and like the second we hit, like the whole back windshield falls into the car. <laughs> <laughs> like eight million pieces of glass. My dad's pissed. You know, just the worst day ever. And his son won't stop fucking complaining about his stomach for some stomach. reason. Yeah, yeah. And then I woke. And then like an hour later, I was like, I. I my dad was just like, "This, we got to go to the hospital." And then immediately they're like, "You got to get you know surgery and stuff." So then I had the appendicitis, which was fine. You know, it's whatever. I mean, all compared to other surgeries I've had, it was fine. And then uh, since then, I've also had three different shoulder surgeries. Why? What's going on with the well, shoulder? Well, I had, I tore a labrum uh, and I was, I tore, like, I think playing basketball or bench pressing and I had it torn for four years. So it was just constantly, I couldn't lift my arm like over this for years. And I just figured that was just my way of life. Got the labrum surgery, that fixed it. Then like a year later, the labrum started fraying again. But then they realized, because I did an MRI. Is this all a result of what happened in your chest originally? Is this like... No, but this part is actually kind of a weird oddity thing as well, is that they found out... The reason I've been having shoulder problems, because inside the ball of my shoulder, like in the in like solid bone where it's supposed to be solid, was completely hollow. There was like a cyst inside the bone. Oh. So my shoulder's been like weak my whole life, which has caused all of the other compensating and issues for it and stuff like that. So they had to, they did two surgeries at once where they went in, drilled into the bone, took out the, the you know, the cyst, replaced it with donor bone so it would make it a solid bone. And then while that surgeon was done, the other surgeon tagged in, fixed up the labrum, shaved down the collarbone, all that other stuff, and then did that. And that was like the last one I had was during, it was during COVID, it was like 2021 or something, where it was like, I was alone in the hospital, all that other shit. How and long were you in there? I was just there for the day, but like what's crazy is you weren't allowed to have family or friends in there with you. And I was, you know, they make you not eat for so long beforehand. And I was, I'm pretty, I don't love needles, but I'm like, okay with them. But this woman came over and she was like uh, the nurse. And I go, I gave her my hand to put the IV in. I'm like, I know this game by now, you know? And she was like, I'm actually going to put the IV in your wrist. And I was like, the writ. Why? It's always that one that wants to experiment. Uh, yeah. And I'm like, look how veiny my hand. I'm like, I'm right. They're right here. It's There's cool. no reason. And she's like, I mean, just like stabbing my writ, just not finding a vein. It's just over and over again. And then she finally got it in. And I was like, okay. And then she was like, you know what? It's Can't not. Can't bend your wrist. Yeah. And she was yeah. like, it's not dripping up enough. She's like, I'm going to take it out. I'm just going to put it in your hand. And I was like, <clears throat> and for some reason, when she was taking it out of my wrist, dude, that I just was like, Apparently, what I said out loud was like, "Nope, don't like that," and then I just passed out. You I just, just fully, <laughs> you passed out. just fully swooned. I was like, everything got black, and then, dude, and then I wake up and I think, like, I don't know what's happening. You know, when you, I don't know if you ever passed I out. Haven't. 
Dude, I've collapsed and blacked out. But okay, yeah. yeah. Well, it's like you like, wake up, you don't know how long you've been out. Exact, it could be ten seconds or ten hours. I thought the surgery was over. That's how oh, confused no. I was. <laughs> and the worst part is, I wake up from the the blacking out, and it's like you know, nurses around me, they got like ice chips on my neck, and I was like, oh wow, that was like a crazy surgery. And I looked down, and they were like, we had to wait for you to wake back up before putting the IV. They didn't even put. The, I still had to go through the whole process of putting the IV in again after that. Where they're like, now that you're awake. Let's put it back in. I was like, you guys are monsters, absolute monsters. So, um, but yeah, the surgeries went well. Now it's like, I'm the strongest, my shoulder's the strongest it's ever been in my life. Cause apparently when you're a kid, you can get some cysts, but they're supposed to go away. But mine of course did not. So yeah, dude, it's been, it's been a nightmare. But something. you've also had a lot of injuries that aren't just from that to why would it, what did you, I don't know. I do, Were I just, you a like, daredevil kid? Did you I was, fucking... yeah, I was a daredevil kid. I told you like, I basically had like, Jackass was like such a giant influence in all my whole life. Like that was right at the perfect this age. This is what's interesting to me about that, though, is Jackass is a group effort. Mm -hmm. You're a solo kid. Well, all of my boys, we okay. all, yeah, all right. it was okay. a group you effort. You weren't just around the house by yourself. No, all no, right. no. Okay. But, all right. but I, was, I was always smart in that I was obsessed with cameras. Like I always had like a camera ever since I was a kid. Like I always would be the one filming things. And I was very good at like talking my friends into doing jackass stuff. And they'd be like, why don't you fucking do it? I'm like, yeah, but I'm filming it, dude. It's going to be great. And so I always got to like all of the ones that were like violent or like things where it was like, you know, we're going to just, you know, roll out of a moving car or like, you know, do the all this. Like, I would just convince them that I'm going to get the best footage of this and convince them to do it. And it was really, uh, it was really quite odd. But also we did dumb shit in my car. It's just a, we did a lot of like reckless, all that stuff when they would post that thing on Jackass in the beginning where they're like, warning don't try this at home we won't look at some mission tapes don't even try this we would we would see that and we'd be like i know what they mean you know what I mean? <laughs> they know just want to see mean. a good one and that's what they want i get it legally they gotta say it but like they're interested you know what were some of the wildest ones you guys did um i mean we would just drive a lot of it was like car related stuff man which wasn't you know which wasn't great but like we would drive recklessly we would also like get into fights with motorists you know what i mean like start fights you know what i'm saying like we would go to like mcdonald's and get like food and then we'd be out of like a red light with a car and then like the second the light would turn green we'd just like throw the tomato like onto there like yeah, you know what i mean yeah. like you throw a milkshake just being like piece of shit kids and stuff like that and then have and then like most times people in long island like they will chase you they will chase you until you get away and my buddy was like a getaway driver he just he had no they were, he would just reckless, blow through red lights, just cutting across lanes and stuff like that. The worst one was we um, we did a fake kidnapping. Uh, oh, shit. Yeah. So we drove, we were down in, uh, in Port Jeff outside of a bar that had like a line outside of it. And we drove up. Um, we had our friend in the trunk and he was banging on the on the roof. And we opened it. We were like, shut the fuck up. You know, like pretended to hit him and then got back in the car and people were like, what the fuck? What was that? You know, they're all horrified. And then uh, this other car, I guess like a, this Samaritan like person that saw it started like kind of like chasing us. So then my buddy goes into his evasive maneuvers, blowing red lights, cutting across double yellow lines, just illegally driving like crazy. And then like after like five minutes of chasing us, they fucking put a light on because it was an undercover. It was undercover cops. Oh, shit. Uh, so they pull us over, draw the guns. Guns us. are out. Guns are drawn. Oh, man, are Dude, you shitting in their yourself? Mind, they saw a kidnapping. Yeah, yeah they really did. And now did. this guy is illegally driving. Yeah, you're lucky they're not shooting and yeah. asking later. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, so they, so <laughs> they, they pull the guns on us. They go get the fuck out of the car, and they do that thing. And we're just trying to explain to them, but they're not listening. You no. know, we're like we're like 17. We don't know because this is also what every person does when they get pulled over. Yes. telling them they're first. No, no, you don't understand. No, we're boys. That's yeah, yeah. A, and they go, and they literally do the thing where they go. What's in the trunk? And we have to be like, ah, all right. So like, it's a guy, but like we're boys and he'll tell you we're boys <laughs> when you open it. You'll see, you'll see. And we open it. And my buddy who's been getting like thrown around, you know what I mean? In the trunk, they open it. He's like, they're like, are you okay? And he's like, no, no, they're my friends. And they don't believe him. They think he's, he's like, got the like, something. you know, like, cause <laughs> yeah, we're behind like him, like, tell him, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he's like they, they we had to like show ids we had to show pictures of us like from like being friend like he just we had to call the the his parents had to show, -uh. so i had to call his parents to be like is this we got is this a real kidnapping is this kid just lying and stuff like that and then they i mean uh, somehow 
almost hey, credit to the cops for doing that. At least yeah. they could have just been like, yeah, and you guys really could have been fucking that kid up. Yeah, yeah. like the Dahmer situation yeah. where they just let that little boy back mm-hmm. go into the thing. Um, but yeah, we somehow impossibly, as far as I can remember, got away. Like we could, there was no guns. All, all our parents like were called. That was like the worst of it. But they didn't do it. They didn't give my friend any tickets for all the speeding that he did and all that other shit. So yeah, man. I mean, just jackasses. We're idiots. Just terrible. <laughs> Did anybody ever really get hurt? Uh, my friend had like, yeah, he got like his knees fucked up and stuff like that just from like, you know, literally shopping carts, you know, going in those metal great shopping carts, pushing them as hard as you can into a curb and just seeing what happens, that kind of a thing. We had this. Oh, uh, go ahead. Sorry. Also, no. this is just a real, my buddy would, we would go to this, there was this one street in our um, block that, or in our neighborhood that was like obnoxiously wide for some reason. It was way wider than all of the other streets. And it was like a kind of an in-between street. And we would just do donuts in that. And my buddies and I, uh, but mainly my buddies, because it was my car, would go on the roof of the car. No. And no straps, nothing. Just hold on to the roof. Lay or like squat hold? Are you you Spider-Man or are you like laying down? No, they're like they're like laying. They're laying down. Um, But... We're doing donuts and they're just holding on to it. And like one of us, you know, we probably like we're grabbing his ankle from inside the car or something, but like just almost in an effort to like, let's see if we can throw him from the top of this car onto the concrete. Um, And shockingly, nobody like it was one of those things where it was like the only time someone fell was like right as we were stopping and they kind of just rolled off. But I mean, easily could have been killed. Any of us. Dead. 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 I don't know how anybody makes it past 16. I, we were reckless. We used to have this uh, bridge. It was on the 32, Route 32, and um, it was 100 feet from the top. So there were rafters under it. There were about 50. Yeah. And then the top was 100. We took a tape measure, measured it. And when you're swimming under it and you look up, it doesn't look that bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're yeah. like, eh, it's up there. <laughs> but when you get up there... And you look over, and the first thing you will see are like leaves or something floating on the water top. So it gives you a perspective. You're like, right. Holy fuck. So people started to want to jump off of it. And it became this like after school thing. People would go down to watch people do uh-huh. it. Other people would swear they're going to do it. And um, we had known a, a, of an arrival school. It's called South Carroll for us. Uh, we were Liberty there, South Carroll. And one of the kids there, I think they were doing night swimming, and he jumped. And apparently there's a, a cable or something way down there. And I guess his foot got stuck and he never came up. So we would only do it he during died? the day. Yeah, he died. Oh, um, shit. We would only do this during the day. And we would only do it if we would have six or seven people swimming out in the water. So if you came down, they would dive down right away right. To, to be there at least to try to help you. There were people that would wait up in the rafters and jump in yeah. if you needed more help. Um, because that wasn't that high. 50 feet's not that bad, you know? It's bad. Yeah, it's tough. But 100 is stupid. 100 is uh, insane. And so we had this one, we're still friends this day. This one kid, Chris Sheeler, was always like, uh, you know, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. You ain't going to fucking do it. He's like, I'm going to do it. Every day, every day he's going to do it and he never does it. So one day, I go, you know what? If you do it, I'll do it. And he's like, are you serious? I go, yes, because you're not going to fucking do it. Right. So we walk up, we get on, and a guy comes up with us to make sure that if he goes, I go. And I said, you don't need to make sure. If he goes, I'm going, but he's not going. Right. And we're up there for 20 fucking minutes. And cars, they're riding by, you know? And um, I'm like, you're not doing it. So I turn around, and I just hear this noise. I just hear a And I turn back around, he is fucking gone. And oh. I look over and this motherfucker's screaming, going My down. My like, God. A no. hundred <laughs> feet, dude. <laughs> he did it. And he went in and he came up screaming, like, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, no, no. pain. No, didn't get hurt? No. Well, some people certainly did. So um, I'll tell you what happened. So I had to do it. And it took me a while. I got out over the edge and I held back and I kept letting go. You know, yeah, like yeah, I just yeah, kept yeah. waiting for the miss and I wasn't missing. Yeah. I was not missing. And then I let go and I pin dropped in and man, the water, maybe the first eight feet is warm. It's sun beat. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. Man, you go down deep. It's pitch black. It's fucking cold down there. So I panic, you know, I panic, swim back up and I'm all stoked that I did it. And I get out and the next day in school, my ass 
Yeah. And, and the bottoms of my fucking feet. Uh huh. From slapping I that had, hard. Man, fucking hurt so bad. I couldn't sit in my chair comfortably or whatever. A girl went up and did it. Didn't close her legs. She got her vagina torn and had oh. to go had to go to the ER because she got a tear. Torn, torn, bro. Oh. It's a hundred feet up. You, know, yeah. you, you can't be going down reckless with no, your legs. No, 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 no. You gotta be tight. Yeah, you know? she's you just riding a bull. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, get out uh, of my here. My brother, he's an idiot. So he decided that jumping wasn't enough anymore. Sure. Now somebody's got a jackass, yeah. you know? And they were trying to flip off. And my brother made the mistake of, uh, he, he got scared. But instead of flipping straight out, he sort of went off to that that flip where you go this way. Uh -huh. You know, that that I'm yeah. not fully committed Yeah, shit. yeah, yeah. The panic flip. And he went wildly coming down. He slapped on his ribs. He came up. We have it on video. Somebody still has that somewhere oh on VHS. Oh, my God. And he was spitting up blood for like a day. Did he go to the hospital? No. Sick. That's what I'm of saying. Course. He's, that, he's just, that idiot. He's like, no. Just man. classic. Just if it classic. lasts more than a day, I'll do it. And he didn't. Dude, I, I the only thing I've, I jumped off a 62 foot cliff in Hawaii once and I was watching, I like, it's like a, just a jutted out into the ocean kind of a thing. And it was like a long swim. It would be like a long swim back. It was like a few, and it was a, like a pretty strong, it was in Kauai. It was like a very strong current. You had to be a really strong swimmer. And I was- That's, I, the, that's the thing we didn't have. This was just lake dead water, yeah, you know? Yeah, this was like, like strong current. So I'm like, pretty nervous about it. I'm like worried about, is it even deep enough? Here? Are there rocks here? And I saw like local, like Hawaiian dudes, like literally like not even break stride from climbing up this thing and then just do three front flips and land and then just swim and go. And I, yeah, dude, I was up there for probably 30 to 35 <laughs> minutes by myself, just being like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do. And people are like hiking past me being like, are you jumping? <laughs> They've circled around. You yeah. still here, Mike? Literally, someone did. Someone went, I can't believe you're still here. And they got, it was this old couple that finally gave me the courage because I was like, an old guy. Well, that was the other thing, too, because I'm like, one of the times I was, I'm not making this up, dude. One of the times I was about to jump, I had like the, the, like the, my legs were bent. I looked down and where I was planning on jumping was a fucking sea turtle, like at the top. And I'm like, if I landed on a, it just shattered everything, you know? So I I told this old couple who had just yeah, I, that been, dinosaur ain't even gonna budge. Yeah. What, what fly just hit me? <laughs> yeah, and I'm yeah. just melted. <laughs> and so I told those this older couple that saw me go by, and I was like, just can you like if if I just you know make sure that I come up, you know, and if not, go tell somebody because my wife was like at the pool, you know, go and she was like nowhere, no one was there. Yeah, right. So I I finally jumped off, and dude, I did like the the running kind of like running bicycle thing, and. The other thing, dude, I'm sure you experienced too, you just never, you're falling for so long. I can't even imagine 100 feet, 62 feet. You're, I was falling and then you're like gaining speed as it's going. And you're, and you're well aware you're of how getting, fast you're hauling it's, ass. It's getting yeah. faster yeah, and like, faster <laughs> and you're like, yeah. I, why haven't I hit the water yet, you know? And then when I hit, I was like, I think I was like in between running because I do, I landed on like my ass and thigh. And like you said, dude, I, for the rest of that trip, I had a, my whole back of my leg was completely bruised. It felt like a slap. I couldn't sit down. It was yeah. none of that. So I, I totally uh, relate to what you're saying, but I can't imagine that a hundred feet. And then I found out that same cliff, I found this out afterwards, that same cliff Justin Bieber had jumped off of mm -hmm. and it, it blew out his eardrum. Jesus. So he had to like cancel his entire tour. It was like a notorious, like, don't do this cliff. Oh, no shit. Yeah, so I ended up, I again, had I known that, I probably wouldn't have. I've told this story before and and I, a long time ago, probably on the crab feast and people call bullshit, but I, I, I called my younger brother after I told him and I go, people don't believe that fucking story. So off to the side of that bridge you got the bridge about 100 and then there's a cliff off to the side yeah. to the left and what we used to do is take we take our swimming masks and stuff and we'd all swim the bottom to make sure there were no rocks under there because it's obviously not clear sure. water or anything and everybody be like this is a good spot to go and then there was just a place we called the rock and it was just a little you know 10 foot jump off and you just hang out people are drinking smoking whatever but this was just off so some people are jumping off the bridge here and then you just come down here for the people that were not as stupid right yeah, and wanted yeah. to do something a little less dumb <laughs> and we always would play fucking dumb like oh you know jaws is something's pulling you under right, somebody right. go out and we'd always yell snake snake or whatever and one time my fucking brother jumps in and he's out there swimming and we look out and there's a fucking water moccasin that's hauling ass right coming right at him yeah in the water a snake and we're screaming snake 
Snake. We've yelled snake so many fucking Boy times. Boy cried wolf. Exactly. He doesn't even pay. He said, like, whatever. We're like, we're all now we're all doing it. We're yeah. throwing rocks. He's like, stop. He turns around. This motherfucker's like, yeah, yeah. He's like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. He starts swimming. I'm like, I don't think he's gonna fucking make it. My friend, this true story, Jeff Wagner, he was like, this is like late neighborhood legend shit. He was the guy, the you know, best player in baseball. Sure. He went to the University of Maryland. He was really fucking good. This kid takes one of those flat, like, shale rocks, and he fucking throws it. And I promise you, Mike fucking Feeney, it cut that goddamn snake in No half. way. I'm telling you. I was just saying, like, if you had said he just hit it, I'd be it like, that's crazy. cut it in half, and it broke like this, and then it slowly floated like this. And we were like, get the fuck. Ah! <laughs> we're going nuts. We're going nuts. I called my brother after I told that story because people were like, you're full of shit. I'm like, Todd. They don't fucking believe. He's like, yeah. Wagner threw that rock and cut the snake in half. I got cut <laughs> in half. It cut in half. He goes, it cut it wow. in half. I was like, Oh, wow, my dude. God. You actually weirdly just reminded me of a near-death experience that I had that, that I've forgotten about to tell you about <laughs> <laughs> that I might have blacked out on purpose. Um, I was, so I was, this was in between one of my years of college. It's probably after my freshman year of college when my mom, my mom had moved to Florida at that point. So she's, uh, you know, I I would work at the surf shop during the day, right on the beach, and I would go surfing like all the time, right? So one of the first times I went, like, literally the first time, it was like New Smyrna Beach, which is kind of like a great surfing beach on the east coast of Florida. Also, the shark bite capital of the world. It is? Shark, yeah. And not, they have like- That's the east coast? Yeah. It's like six foot, not deaths, like bites. They have, bites. Like, they have Sand like all sharks these six shit. foot, yeah, okay. whatever, sharks that come in. So they get people get bit, then they go to like get stitched up, go right back out surfing. It's like so that's like the notion I'm having going into this. So I'm starting to paddle out. I'm kind of near the jetties, you know, where like the surf point is. I'm starting to paddle out, and then suddenly I see as I'm paddling, I'm getting closer. Like the current taking me closer to the jetties. So I was like, oh, that's not good. So I turned my board to paddle away from the jetties, and the current. I mean, within it felt like seconds took me out past the past the jetties and on the other side of it which was oh you went around just open ocean there's like no beach there's no nothing it's just i'm gone and like i'm so, i want to say not to interrupt you but there's a place in ocean city maryland they call it the inlet and it's where the bay side meets the ocean where they literally touch at the end of that right and it's it's okay over here and if you go over there it's, it's madness just, you're by yourself yeah so i'm like and like I, the beach is packed and seemingly nobody is seeing me drift away. And I'm starting to do that thing of like, ah, I was a lifeguard, so I'm like, I'm a great swimmer. So I, I'm kind of swimming, I'm panicking a little bit, but I'm like, it's okay. And everyone's just getting further and further away. I'm kind of like waving to people, no one's doing anything. I get onto that other side of the jetties. Now I'm just in open ocean. No one can even see me anymore. So I'm freaking out. So I go, I'm losing ground on this, uh, on this board. So I'm gonna jump off and I'll swim. So I jump off and I start trying to swim and I'm like really swimming hard and I'm not gaining or losing ground. Like I'm just in place essentially and I'm getting starting to get tired and now I'm like really starting to freak out. And How long uh, do you think you're out there at this point? I must have been out there like uh, like alone probably like at least like 15 minutes. Damn, well, yeah, like of just being like alone alone. Are you trying to signal for anything The at only that point? people that I could still see where there were like some older Asian fishermen that were on like the jetties of the rocks. They're not even facing my direction though. They're just kind of like, you know, real and stuff. And so I'm like panicking, dude. And again, keeping in mind shark bite capital, all alone, looking like a seal, you know what I yeah. mean? Like just not good. So then I realized, uh, I remembered from being a lifeguard like that, you know, be, doing like the backstroke is a lot less effort than doing the front stroke. So I start doing the backstroke and I'm actually like gaining a little bit of ground, but I'm still like working my ass off. So I, I do it. I backstroke for at least, I don't know, another five to 10 minutes. And I finally got towards the other side of the jetties. And one of those Asian fishermen like saw me and like scaled down the thing into that and like brought me back up as I'm getting nah. like, I'm getting like crashed into the rocks, dude. My board is all like in pieces, ding. And it's all sharp rocks. So I'm like, I'm bleeding, which again, now the blood with the sharks. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, I'm yeah. getting like, every day he's like trying to reach me and then the current would smash me into the rocks. And I'm my, my elbows cut, everything's cut. Like I'm just getting, 
uh, annihilated by these waves. And this one guy, and, the, and, and then my, of course, the board leash is stuck to the thing. And my board was all broken anyway. And the guy was like yelling at me. He's like, just leave the fucking board. Yeah. So I was like, all right. So I like left the board out. And then I, you know, he got me back up. I'm all bloody and stuff. And I go over to my family and like friends that are at the beach with me. And I'm like, hey, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck, guys? Like, and they're all like, what's up? And I'm like, Look at me! Where's my board? Like you didn't see me? I was out there, and they're like, "We thought that was you." And to be fair, like it was every white guy, like with the surfboard. They're like, "We thought that guy was you." That guy. And then, like friends are just like drinking a beer on the beach as I'm just about to. I mean, it's just it was uh, it was terrifying, dude. It was to be in that ocean, like that side of it. I had that like, uh, uh, okay, it's a long okay, time. yeah. It was it was so long, and um, yeah, man, it was it was a very terrifying experience dude i've had a couple of those in my life where it's like you can't communicate when you're going through that panic and you just need somebody to pay attention like this is completely unrelated to that but it is a similar thing where i didn't like learn how to ride a bike until i was way too old you know like i was way too old i'm i asked my i I asked my dad before i came to do this i was like what's the (laughs) age on it we ballparked it somewhere between 10 or 12, but closer to like 12. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's but late. it's too old, dude. Yeah, that's way uh, too old. Because it's embarrassingly old because the first time I went to ride a bike, my dad put steering wheel, uh, training wheels on. And as I was riding around the block with my neighborhood, the training wheel flew off. And I went into the street, almost got hit by a car. So it freaked me out. So I wouldn't go for years. So what I was doing was I was on like the big wheelie. You remember that? It's like the tricycle mm-hmm. with like plastic tires and all yeah. that stuff. And I would try to like keep up with my, my friends are riding bikes at this point. I'm on like on a scooter, you know, I'm like trying to like keep up with them and stuff. And my next door neighbor, Stephanie, she was awesome. She was like five years older than me or maybe a little bit less, but she was older than me and she was deaf. And, um, and she would ride, she'd be on a mountain bike. I was still on this big wheelie, these plastic tricycle things. Yeah, so, with the power brake back then. Yeah, 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 dude. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so I came up with this great idea because I can never keep up with her because she was on a mountain bike. And I was like, here's what we'll do. Let's tie my big wheelie to your mountain bike. And then you just kind of take off and I'll like be going as fast. This will be sick, you know? And so we tie it up and then um, I sit down in the big wheelie. And before I can grab this, because we tied it to the middle of the steering column. The second, before I could grab the steering column, she just takes off. And it turned the steering column sideways into my chest, like locking me in place. And we know and now, about that chest, And bro. we know about that. It was right in the hole. It was right in the hole. <laughs> <laughs> it's holding it in there. It's probably, yeah, no, hey. <laughs> yeah. But the, the, the tire was turned sideways. Right, yeah. So it could just only, like so that. it was like that. Yeah. And she was like, like grinding it. <laughs> And so it just flipped me over oh, no. with only my elbows and knees being dragged on the concrete on oh, a sidewalk. Yeah. So now I'm like, just, I'm losing. And this is the point where you, as a kid, you're like, that was a fucking dumb idea, but not a problem. We'll just yell out to Stephanie. God damn it. She's deaf. She can't hear anything. <laughs> and dude, she, she pedaled for like a full two houses. <laughs> Before turning around, standing just, up, I'm like, Ugh. yeah, she's like, <laughs> you know, and she is hauling it, and I am just like dread elbows and knees. I don't know if you can see, like I have scars on my elbows, <laughs> like, like just being dragged on my elbows and knees by a deaf girl, and she turned around, like being like, uh huh, and just you loving them, blood, blood. <laughs> Blood lined oh. street and a child <laughs> screaming for his life, dude. Oh, it hurts my stomach. Dude. Yeah, well, it hurt my elbows and knees. Oh, fuck. Yeah, Mike Fiend, this has been a fun, really fun fucking episode. Thanks for uh, having me. Yeah, man. dude, thank you for coming in. And uh, I told you before we were recording your first time here. So after everything we've talked about, tell me advice you would give to sixteen-year-old Mike Fiend. Uh, man, I mean, at this point, you know, the, the, the bad part is, is like with the, with the business part of comedy, I'd be like, start a YouTube page immediately and get, you know, and get, cause while I was always shooting like, you know, dumb little sketches, jackass type things, I was like, man, if I was putting those online when I was 16, I mean, uh, sure I would have, it would have been pretty bad at this point, but at least like that thing. But in terms of just like personal advice, it's like that kind of like the, don't freak out about the future. Like things are going to work out. Like don't stress about, you know, that kind of that dumb, like 
everything happens for a reason or wherever you're at, you're always at where you're supposed to be at kind of a thing. Yep. Um, because there's so many times I've like, you know, I do that. What was the thing you said outside of future? What, what was tripping. it? Future, future tripping. Future tripping. I do that a lot. So there's always that like, well, if I do this, like, especially before we had the kid, we're like, yeah, but then if I do this, then it's like, I'm already so busy with stand up. So then how am I going to add this kid? And then I like, and then what does that mean? Now we can't fit in this apartment. So now we got to move to another, you know, and you just, you go down that whole thing and you're like, you figure it out. You, you know what I mean? Like out. you just can't, you can't plan for all the variables that are going to come. So it's just like, you'll fucking figure it out, man. It'll be fine or it won't, but freaking out about it now is not gonna is not gonna change anything. That's great advice, dude. Yeah. Um, please plug and promote everything again. MikeFeeneyComedy.com uh, for tour dates and all that. And, uh, link to my first uh, comedy special, Rage Against the Routine, which is on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash MikeFeeneyComedy, at I am Mike Feeney across all social media. Come see me in Chicago at the Den Theater on October 7th and Algonquin Theater uh, September 15th. And check out my podcast. Here's a scenario uh, with Mike Cannon and Brennan Sagalow. It's a fun time. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Hell man. yeah, man. I Thank you. This was a lot yeah, of fun, this dude. This was fun. Um, as always, RyanSickler.com. I'm Ryan Sickler on all your social media. Go to YouTube, watch the special, and get your tickets. Come out and see me on the road. We'll talk to y'all next week. Mm -hmm.